Good morning and welcome to KCPS Homeroom. I'm Justin Robinson. This week launches the second semester of Homeroom. This semester we are broadcasting episodes by grade level. Our new schedule is as follows. On Mondays we'll have lessons for pre-K and K. On Tuesday, grades first and second. On Wednesday, lessons for grades three and four. On Thursday, lessons for grades five and six. Friday, we are targeting our secondary students with a focus on real world learning. Again, today is for the third and fourth grade students. Hope you all enjoy class today. Let's get ready to learn with Mr. Morris and reading. Howdy, my name is Samuel Morris and this is third and fourth grade English language arts. Welcome. Today we're gonna to talk about the elements of a nonfiction text and how to identify those and communicate those in an organized fashion. So today when we get started, you're going to need your week one printouts found on the website and something to write with and to follow along with me. So let's get started. So speaking of organization, that's going to be the main focus when we're dealing with nonfiction texts. Because if, if we can communicate what a nonfiction text is about, we can essentially communicate the nonfiction text. And what I mean by nonfiction is something that's informational or fact-based. So let's just use something off the top of our heads at the present moment, right? Uh, a current event that's going on, the Chiefs. Are in the playoffs, right? So let's see. The Kansas City Chiefs are in the playoffs. Okay, so that's going to be the main idea of whatever article we read with this title, or or that's even remotely about the Kansas City Chiefs in the playoffs. It's that's the main idea. So what we're going to do today is we're going to create a graphic organizer around the Kansas City Chiefs and the players. Now we're going to include some details. And again, we're coming up with these on our own because we're going to have some experiences later where we read some that have already be, been written. And it's going to be a little bit more natural after we've practiced with our own ideas to practice with the ideas of other people. So first, let's see. The Kansas City Chiefs and in the playoffs. We're going to add a detail to this main idea right here, add another detail, add a third, and a fourth detail to this main idea. So one of the details, right, is that we won last week against Buffalo, right? That is a detail that supports the main idea that the Kansas City Chiefs are in the playoffs and now competing for the Super Bowl. Oh, I just gave you another one. Another, uh, off of this main idea, another detail is that now they're competing for the Super Bowl. Super Bowl found. Okay. Another detail, and again, there's a hundred details we can include from this because there's many, many ways that we can dissect this. So another detail we can include is maybe a star player, like quarterback number 15. I think we all know who that is, right? And maybe something else is we can say that this is the third consecutive AFC championship appearance. Enough about the Chiefs. Let's get practicing with some nonfiction text. So in that same spirit, we're going to use this graphic organizer and this structure for when we read a paragraph. When we read a text, it could be as simple as a paragraph like we're going to read today. It can be an entire newspaper article all the way up to an entire book or entire series. This structure is really going to help us with those elements of nonfiction and being able to clearly communicate the main idea, supporting details, and those really basic structural parts of a nonfiction text. So you'll have a couple of these in your printouts that are blank, main idea with details. This one is for you to take notes on right here, just so you understand that the main idea goes in the middle and the details go on the edges, just like we did earlier. And we're going to practice now with some texts. So the first text we're going to look at 
is about shapes. That's the title of it, right? So I, I already have an idea that the main idea is going to be about shapes, maybe some specific shape, but let's read and find out. So feel free to follow along with me. Shapes. Many different shapes are considered quadrilaterals. A quadrilateral is any shape that has four sides. Squares, rectangles, rhombi, and trapezoids are some, of, some examples of quadrilaterals. Triangles, pentagons, hexagons, and octagons are not considered quadrilaterals because they do not have four sides. All right. So if I'm going to think about the main idea, what was spoken about, well, most, I'm going to say quadrilaterals. Oh, it was mainly about quadrilaterals, which, as we know, are four-sided shapes. And, oh, there's one of our details, right? So four sides. Okay, now let's look for another detail. And we can even use our memory for this one, too. I, I remember from math class, and I also remember from the reading, that a four-sided shape is a square, a rectangle. Those are a couple of the examples of four-sided shapes. We also know that there's some other less common shapes like rhombus and trapezoid. Like a rhombus and a trapezoid. Both of those have four sides too, making them quadrilaterals. And then the text is a little bit specific at the end right here where it tells us things that are not. So some non-examples, non-examples are things like triangle, pentagon, and hexagon, and a couple more as well. All right. So we see here that this graphic organizer has helped us understand what the main idea is and then some of those supporting details. And we can take this big chunk of text, break it down first into this graphic organizer where we analyze the elements. And then lastly, be able to say a sentence like, that paragraph was about quadrilaterals, which have four sides, like squares and rectangles, rhombus and trapezoids, and, and you know, not the shapes like triangles, pentagons, and hexagons that have three, five, and six sides respectively because, well, that's not four. So let's try again with another article. At the gym. Women's gymnastics is a very popular sport to watch during the Olympics. The girls compete in four different events, uneven bars, balance beam, vault, and floor. While the women's floor routine is to music, the uneven bars, balance beam, and vault are not to music. Men's gymnastics has six different events. Hmm. I almost feel like this is going to begin talking about men's gymnastics now and then we get cut off. But that's okay. Because we know that the main idea, whether it's women's or men's, or whether we're talking about the specific sport or not, is, yep, gymnastics. And in this case, we can go ahead and say women's for our excerpt here because 90% of this is about women's gymnastics. Now, some of those supporting details. The very first one we see is that it's popular to watch during the Olympics. So we can say popular Olympic sport. All right, oops, popular is with a U. <laughs> popular Olympic sport, all right? Then we see that there are four different events and three, one, two, three are not to music and one is to music. Okay, that's kind of a lot to swallow. So let, let's put it in a simple sentence. Four events for women. We learn at the end that there are six events for men and that some are to music. All right. So again, we take this chunk of text we turn it into an organized graphic and web and chart where we can see, okay, it's about gymnastics and here are the supporting details. And then we can turn that even further, right, into a clear and coherent sentence. The text we read was about women's gymnastics, which is a popular Olympic sport. There's four events for women and, and six for men, and some of those are to music. It's very popular to watch during the Olympics. Lastly, what we're gonna do is it's your turn 
You're going to read this text on planetary bodies that's again found in those printouts and do the same thing. Tell me what the main idea is, and I'm pretty sure you can already guess based on the photo, based on the text. But after you read it, you'll have a really good understanding and you'll be able to find those four supporting details. Well, that concludes our lesson for today. I really hope that you found it useful and that it was as much of a pleasure for you as it was for me today. Again, my name is Mr. Morris. It's been great to have you today. I wish you the best of luck in the next unit in math. And as always, go Chiefs. Hi, and welcome back to KCPS Homeroom. Hope you're ready for some math. I'm Miss Aker, welcome to my classroom. And thank you for inviting me into your home. Today we have a lot of fun stuff planned and I wanna start with our just know it. So we're gonna start every math session that you do with me with thinking about things we already know, just like that. And to warm up, I wanna sing our Frankie the Fraction Frog song because today we're gonna to be working on our fractions. Let's go. Here's Frankie and he's ready to sing with you. Follow along while we sing the song together. Here we go. Frankie the Fraction Frog song. Frankie is the name and fractions are the game. Numerators on top, so I hop, hop, hop. Denominators down, go to the ground. Nice job. Take a look at Frankie's lily pads. He has one at the start and one at the end of our number line. He starts here at zero, and he's trying to get to that spot that we've marked where the fly is. So he hops, one, he grabs that fly, <clears throat> yum, Frankie, and then he goes underneath to the other lily pad. So he, how many times did he hop? One hop. That's the numerator. One out of how many did he have to get to the other lily pad? One, two. One out of two. He hopped halfway there. Nice job, Frankie. Let's practice some more Just Know It with some fractions and see if you can name them just like that. Here we go. I'm going to hold up some note cards with fractions on them or models that represent fractions. I want you to say out loud at home what the fraction is and just know it, just like that. And then we'll do it a second time and we'll check our work. Are you ready? Give me a thumbs up when you're ready. Okay, here we go. First one. You know it. You got this. Nice job. Looks like a pizza. Almost there. Last one. Wow, great work. Do you think you got them all? Did you just know it? Let's find out. Okay. Did you say two fifths? Nice work. What about Two thirds. The numerator is two. The denominator is three. How about this one? One, two, three parts make up the whole and only one of them is shaded. One third. You got it. One out of three. Remember this one like a pizza? There's four parts and one is shaded. One fourth. You got that one. Ooh. Half of it shaded, that means two parts, one half. And then we got one fourth. And last but not least, one half. Nice work, everyone. You really knew that. Let's move on to our next part, which is figure it out. Today's figure it out is to figure out where we use fractions in the real world. We can use them all sorts of different places. So think about it for a second and we're going to come up with some ideas together. I asked you to think of real world examples of fractions where you see them every day. One of my favorite examples is with food. Thumbs up if you 
always want to make sure that you get an equal piece of the pizza. You don't want someone else to get the bigger piece. You want it to be fair and even. There are lots of ways to use fractions when you're working with food. Another real world example is different activities that you might do, like when your teacher is one third of the way through the book, or when your soccer game is at the half time and you have another half to go. Those are all real world examples of activities with fractions. Another example that you know a lot about is time. When there's only 15 more minutes or a quarter of an hour to go in school. You get very excited when school's almost out. Or you know that you have half an hour of recess time. That's 30 minutes. Half of an hour is 30 minutes, one half. Another real world example, like Frankie on our number line, is distance. He jumped halfway to his lily pad. He was almost there. Or maybe you've been in the car with your grandma or your mom or dad or somebody who's taking you somewhere and you're, you say, are we there yet? And they're like, no, we are only a quarter of the way through the trip. That's one fourth, that's a fraction. And I couldn't help, I just had to put it on there twice. Another food example. I love cake and I always want to get the biggest piece, but that's not really fair. So it's good to make sure that you're cutting your cake pieces in equal slices, equal parts of the whole. That way, everybody's satisfied. Wow, good job on figuring out some real world examples. It's time for what's new. And today I have Frankie here to help me with our learning target. So let's take a look at it. It's right here behind me. I can use models to recognize and generate equivalent fractions. Oh wow, why do teachers always do that? They add a bunch of fancy words in our learning targets. Sometimes it's hard to figure out. Well, let's break it down together. I can use models. Well, I know from our Just Know It that models is a fancy way of saying drawings. So we can draw. To recognize, oh, I think recognize is like to see it, to know it. And generate, hmm, that's, that's a word I'm not really sure of. I think to generate means to make it or to create it. Equivalent fractions. Well, I know that we've been working on fractions and that is an example of a fraction is the numerator over the denominator, like one-fourth, one-half, two-thirds. Those are examples of fraction. But this word equivalent, what does equivalent mean? Well, it kind of sounds like equal. So I think we're gonna make fractions that are equal to each other. Let's read it again and see if we understand. I can use drawings to know and create equal fractions. I think we can do that. And the two models that I'm gonna teach you to use today to make some equivalent or equal fractions are ones that you're familiar with. The first one is the number line, like we were using with Frankie. And the second one is an area or bar model. Those can be used kind of interchangeably. So let me get started on how we can make equal or equivalent fractions. Let's start what's new by you grabbing some paper. It could be scratch paper, notebook paper, any paper you have nearby, or even a marker board, and a writing tool like a pen or pencil. I'm gonna be using a Sharpie so that you can see clearly what I'm doing. Here we go. Let's start by proving that one half equals something out of four. So we know that the numerator of this is one out of two parts. And we don't know the numerator here yet, but we know we need four parts. So let's start with our number line. It can be kind of tricky sometimes drawing your number line on your own, but you can do it. Start by drawing a straight line across. Draw your zero and your one for your one whole. We wanna represent one half on our number line. 
So we know we need to have two parts. So I'm gonna draw a line in the middle. So I have one, two to get to my hole. This one jump would be one half. And if I jumped both, that would be two out of two or one hole. Now I need to figure out what the numerator is to make this equation true. Something out of four parts equals one half. So I'm gonna zoom in on this side of my number line and I'm gonna divide it in half. I'm gonna zoom in on this side and divide that in half. Let me double check that I have four parts. One, two, three, four. Now I have four parts, but I need to figure out how many of those parts is equal to one half. Let's start at zero and let's find out. One fourth and another one fourth. One fourth and one fourth is equal to two fourths. I have solved this equation using a number line, but we can also solve it using an area model. Start by drawing your hole. I like to pretend that this is a cake because I just love cake, but you could pretend it's anything you want. So I'm gonna start by drawing a line down the middle to represent two parts. I'm gonna shade one of those parts, and I just do a quick, I don't need to color it in all the way. So one out of the two parts is shaded. One half is shaded. But I need to find out how much would be shaded if there were four parts. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna cut it in half this way. Now there's one, two, three, four. One fourth, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth. That equals my whole. But how many are shaded? Wow, it's just like over here. Two fourths are shaded. This one fourth and this one fourth for a total of one two fourths. Okay, let's try another one. Let's try to show two thirds equals something out of six. The numerator is two and the denominator is three. That means it takes three parts to make the whole. But over here we have six, which means it means it takes six parts to make the whole. I'm gonna try doing an area model this time. I'm gonna start by drawing my area model box. And I'm going to be generating an equivalent fraction to two thirds. So I know if I wanna make three parts, I gotta draw two lines. So that would be one line here and one line here. So that's about equal parts. And I have one third, one third, one third. I'm gonna shade in two of my thirds. I just kinda of do it like that. So now I have two thirds shaded. But I need to figure out if there are six parts, what would that be equal to? How many parts would be shaded? Think to yourself, what could we do to make this into six parts? Well, I know that three is half of six, so I need to double how many parts I see here. I could do like we did on the last page, and I can draw a line straight through. And now I have, now this is equal, I'm gonna cross this out, because now I have one-sixth here, one-sixth here, this part is one-sixth, this is one-sixth, one-sixth, and one-sixth. I have one, two, three, four, six, six that are shaded in. And that is equal to my two-thirds that were shaded in originally. Wow, we're getting good at this. I think we should try a number line. Okay, this one didn't give us a denominator or a numerator, so we have to figure that out on our own. So remember, when we're doing a number line, we try to do it straight across, we start at zero and one. So if there's five parts, I know I have to draw four lines, so I can get my five equal parts. So I'm gonna start here, one line, two lines, three lines, four lines. Let's double check that we have five parts. One fifth, one fifth, one fifth, one fifth, one fifth. One, two, three, four, five. So this is equal here to five out of five, or one whole. So 
let's find an equivalent fat fraction to one fifth. What if we just divide each of our fifths in half again? Let's try it. We're just drawing, we're just cutting these right in half on our number line. Wow, that's a lot of parts. Notice that when we made the parts smaller, we had many more of them. And let's see how many we have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Wow, ten parts. So the bigger the denominator, the smaller the parts. The bigger the denominator, I mean the smaller the denominator, the bigger the parts. So let's see what's equal to one fifth if we jump on only the tenths. One tenth and then another tenth equals two tenths. So now we've proved that one fifth is an equivalent fraction to two tenths. Nice work. Frankie and I are really glad that you could help us out with those area models and number lines. And so for our try it this time, I want you to try it home to figure out a couple of equivalent fractions. So you can add these to our KCPS Twitter, or you can share them on any of our social media platforms to show us what you come up with. The first one is show the equivalent fraction to one fourth. One fourth equals something out of eighths. Eight parts, four parts. You can figure that one out. And the other one I want you to try on your own is three sixths equals, oh no, we don't know the denominator or the numerator. Your job is to make your own equivalent fraction using number line or area model. Can't wait to see what you do. And just like that, we're out of time. Before we go, I wanna teach you one of my favorites, a firework high five. It goes like this. Clap your hands together. Shh. Clap. Ha. Ah. Do it with me. Ready? Clap. Shh. Ha. Ah. All right. I'll see you next time. Hello. I'm Mr. Steinauer, and this is third and fourth grade science. Today, we'll be going over forces. What is a force, and what kinds of forces are there? All you'll need today is a piece of notebook paper and something to write on so that you can keep track of definitions for some words that you might be introduced to for the first time today. So let's get started. First things first, let's talk about forces. A force is a push or a pull in any direction. We can push something away from us or we can pull something toward us. That can happen in any direction in any number of ways. When we bite into an apple, our teeth push into the apple. When we're closing our door, we're pulling that door closed. Now let's talk about three kinds of natural forces. Gravity, friction, and electromagnetism. The first natural force we're going to discuss today is gravity. Now I'm going to demonstrate gravity with a styrofoam ball. A styrofoam ball is very light. It weighs very little. But what's going to happen when I drop this? Well, let's find out. Was your prediction correct? You probably thought the ball is going to drop, Mr. Steinauer, of course. And you're exactly right. And that is because of a pull force coming from the center of the Earth. This pull force is called gravity. Now, gravity is a natural force that affects everything on Earth. Every single thing that's on it. You, your shoes, everything around you, these chairs, everything in this classroom, even the air that I'm breathing and the air that you're breathing. Gravity 
is a force that affects everything on Earth and any object that's large enough to have gravity. The moon has a little bit of gravity, way less than Earth's, and the sun, which is massive compared to the Earth, has a tremendous amount of gravity compared to the Earth. We couldn't walk on the sun, even if it weren't super hot. The gravity would smush us completely. The second force that we're going to talk about today is similar to gravity in one way. It affects everything on Earth. You can't escape it. It's the force of friction. Friction is a force that pushes against another force. So gravity is a pull force coming from the center of the Earth. But friction is all over. Any effort you make, any force you put into the world, friction is going to push back. I have here a notebook. I'm going to demonstrate friction using this notebook. As I pull this notebook toward me, there's a force that's pushing against me, making it so this notebook doesn't just fly right to me when I touch it. That's friction. When I push this notebook toward you, you'll even see that part of the paper from the other side comes up. That's because of friction pushing toward me. Friction will always push in the opposite direction that you push. Or pull. This is probably a pretty familiar sound to you. It's an awful one. I agree. But it's another demonstration of the force of friction. When we push out from the table and move our chair, friction pushes against us. As we push back, friction pushes forward. The third and final natural force that we're going to discuss today is electromagnetism. Now take a look at that word and listen to it as I say it once more. Electromagnetism. Now what two things do you think electromagnetism describes? Take a second to think about that and then say it out loud. What are the two things that electromagnetism probably describes? That's right, electricity and magnets. Now to demonstrate, I've got a set of magnets right here. Now every magnet has a north and a south pole. They are opposite poles. Earth also has a north and a south pole and is affected by metals spinning around in the core, creating a giant magnet. Now we have a tiny magnet here, two tiny magnets to demonstrate the concept of electromagnetism. So these magnets are opposite, opposite poles, a north pole and a south pole will always be attracted to each other. Opposite charges in electricity will always also be attracted to each other. But what does it mean to be attracted in science? That means there's a pull force happening. So when we take these magnets and hold them near each other, they're going to snap together. And that is because of a pull force known as electromagnetism. Now what would happen if I take two of the same pole. I have two of the same pole here. Now, whether they're North Pole or South Pole is not important because electromagnetism works on the North and South Poles in the same way. So when you have two of the same pole as magnets or two of the same charge as electricity, those actually repel each other. Now, what does it mean to repel? Repel means to push away. So the same poles or the same charge will actually push each other away. It almost feels like there's a little like ball in between them, like a marble I can't get around. 
So electromagnetism, once more, says that opposite charges or opposite poles will pull toward each other. The same poles or the same charges will push each other away. This is electromagnetism. And that is the third and final of our natural forces that we'll discuss. Let's review what we've talked about today. A force is a push or a pull in any direction. We can push away or we can pull toward. Gravity is a pull force coming from the center of the earth. Friction is a force that pushes against another force. And electromagnetism describes two things. First, opposite poles or charges pull toward each other, and like or same charges and poles push each other away. We'll talk more about that in a future lesson. Now it's your turn to find evidence or proof of each of these natural forces. Find evidence for gravity. My evidence was dropping a ball and seeing what happened to it. Find evidence of friction. I used a notebook and pulled it toward me and pushed it toward you. I also moved a classroom table. Finally, find evidence of electromagnetism. Remember, that covers electricity and magnets. My evidence was those tiny little magnets, and I also described how the Earth itself is a giant magnet, then described lightning as natural evidence of electromagnetism. When you found evidence for each of the three kinds of natural forces we discussed, share them with a loved one. That concludes our lesson for today. It has been my pleasure having you in class. I'm Mr. Steinauer. See you next week. Welcome to PE with Coach K, also known as Karina. This PE segment will aim towards third through fifth grade students for today and the entire semester. So for this segment today, we're going to focus on one of the health related fitness components, and that is cardiovascular endurance. What is cardiovascular endurance? Well, cardiovascular endurance is where your heart, your lungs, and your muscles all work together while you're exercising for a long period or an extended period of time. How does that benefit us and our body? How does that benefit you and your mom, your dad? Well, cardiovascular endurance will help anybody sustain physical activity for a long period of time. And normally, You'll need this when you participate in a lot of different sports. For example, basketball. You have players that run up and down the court. They have to sustain and they have to be able to have heart, lungs, and muscles all working together to be able to maintain their breath when they are performing in a basketball game. Another example, soccer. A soccer field is even bigger than a basketball court, and they have to run up and down the field to be able to maintain that breath and that energy while they're playing soccer. So what you need for today is your heart, your muscles, and your lungs. That's it. Because for this first segment, I am going to teach you 10 different exercises that you can do at home, in your living room, in your bedroom, in the kitchen, wherever you are, where you have space and opportunity to improve your cardiovascular endurance. So I'll demonstrate each one. We'll do 10 of those for 30 seconds. It will be different each time. I'll demonstrate it. We'll do it for 30 seconds together, and then I'll demonstrate the next while you rest. So while I demonstrate is your opportunity to take a break, 
breathe, grab a drink of water, and then get ready for the next. So cardiovascular endurance exercise number one. Remember, all you need is your heart, your lungs, and your muscles, and maybe a bottle of water off to the side. So the first one we're gonna do is just a jog in place. We're gonna do it for 30 seconds, so it's just a light jog. It's not a sprint where you're running really fast, but you just wanna be light on your feet. And we're gonna do it for 30 seconds. And you can turn to the side with me. I'll turn to the side, I'll turn to the front, and then I'll turn to the other side. But it's up to you. You can stay forward or you can turn to the side as well. So we're gonna do a jog in place for 30 seconds together and then I'll demonstrate the next. Get ready to start in four, three, two, one, and let's jog. We're jogging, very light. And when you jog, you wanna make sure you're breathing in through your nose and just out through your mouth. Light little jog, I'm gonna turn to the side so you can get a different view. Make sure you pick your feet up just a little bit. The knees don't have to go too high. Three, two, one, and rest. So now you can rest and I'll demonstrate cardiovascular endurance exercise number two. So the second one we're gonna do is high knees. So this is when our knees come up right in front of us while we're jumping. And you'll bring your knees up as high as you can while jumping. Lean back just a little bit to get your knees up. And we'll do those for 30 seconds. So get ready, take a deep breath. Let it out. We'll start in four, three, two, one. High knees up. Make sure you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Keep going. Try to get them up as high as you can. You can turn sideways. Can you turn to the other side? You have five, four, three, two, and rest. Okay. Cardiovascular endurance exercise number three. These are called heel kicks, where your heel is kicking your bottom, just like this. So you should feel your heel touch your bottom when you do your heel kicks. And we'll do that for 30 seconds. Take a deep breath. We'll start in five, four, three, two, and one. Heel kicks. Remember to breathe because we're exercising our heart, muscles, and lungs to strengthen our cardiovascular endurance. You have 10 more seconds. And five, four, three, two, and rest. Take a deep breath in and let it out. Cardiovascular endurance exercise number four. We are going to do jumping jacks or sometimes I call them JJs for short. So we'll go ahead and do some jumping jacks for 30 seconds. Remember, your legs open, and when your legs open, your arms come above your head, and then they close together. And then you keep going, open, close, open, close. So if you get a little out of breath in between, then you can slow it down. Or if you feel like you got enough energy to go faster, then you can, it's up to you. But we're gonna start it, take a deep breath. And five, four, three, two, one, and go. Open, close, open, close. 30 seconds. Breathe in through your nose. 
and out through your mouth. If you need to slow down, it's okay. Or you can speed it up. 10 more seconds. Come on. And five, four, three, two, and rest. So, cardiovascular endurance exercise number five. And I'm just gonna do five for this segment. You can have enough energy to do five more for the next. So the fifth one is just a jump rope motion. So you just roll your arms on the side of you and you just slightly come off your toes, very slightly, nice little jump with your arms going in a circular motion as if you were jumping rope. We'll do that for 30 seconds. Take this time to rest while I'm demonstrating and talking, you know, use all of this time you can because we are starting in four, three, two, one, and jump rope. Breathe and out through your mouth. Come on, this is the last one. Remember, we're here to improve our cardiovascular endurance. It's okay. If you're running out of energy, that's normal. Because that means you are working your heart, lungs, and muscles all at the same time. We have 10 more seconds. Can you make it? Speed it up. Five, four, three, two, one, and rest. All right, so we just went over five exercises that you can do at home to improve your cardiovascular endurance wherever you are when you have the space and opportunity. Remember, what is cardiovascular endurance? Cardiovascular endurance is when your heart, your lungs, and your muscles all work together while you're exercising for a long period of time. And this helps you because it helps you sustain physical activity for a long time. So I'm so happy that you joined in today when we were working on our cardiovascular endurance. I want you to practice at home, gather members, sisters, brothers, whoever around you that you can grab to come and join you and work on your cardiovascular endurance together. First one we did, jog in place. And you can do it for a longer period, longer period of time than 30 seconds. You can take it to one minute. So the more you do it, the better you get, the more you can increase your time. First one was jogging in place. Second one, high knees. The third one, heel kick, where you kick your bottom. The fourth one, what was the fourth one? I think the fourth one was jumping jacks. Yep, there we go. There goes my memory. And then the last one was the jump rope, where your arms go in a circular motion as if you were jumping rope. Well, thank you, and I hope to see you next week for a fun cardio challenge. Adios. Today we're going to make a rainmaker using a shipping tube. Um, I already marked out where I want to put my nails at. It's just the seams that they put together when they're making the tube. And we're going to be using just household stuff like some peas, rice, some nails, and beads. And also glue and scissors. That's going to be for when we decorate it. Then later we're going to make some kibasas, just out of regular bottles, kibasas. Then we're going to make a big shaker using the same material that I just showed you. So I'm going to get started putting the nails uh, on my dots that I got for my rainmaker. So on the inside you don't see anything. So when we come back, you'll see the nails like a little uh, feeder. They're going to feed through and make the noise. It sounds like rain. So I'm going to get started on that. It's going to take me a little bit, but we'll be back. 
Okay, so there is the inside of the tube. This is going to be the rainmaker. Those are all the nails, which is quite a bit, quite a bit of nails. It's going to feed through all those, those nails to make the rain effect. And the good thing about having a shipping tube is that you get those plastic ends that you can just put on the end of those. Okay, so now since we've got all our nails in there, we're going to start putting product in here, like peas and beans, and see what kind of effect we're going to get. There's no measurement. I'm just going to put in there what I think. I want to go by my ears. See what my ears tell me. So I'm going to put some beans in there first. I'm just going to hold the bag up to the hole. Okay, that sounds pretty good. So now I'm going to add some rice. You don't have to add rice if you don't want to. If you like the way the beans sound, then you can. But I'm going to add rice. So now i got rice and beans in there. So I kind of want to hear what it sounds like with those two in there before I add anything else. So I put my other top on there and I just spin it up. Okay, sounds okay. But I think I want to put some beads in there too. Just to give it some more some more sound to it. And I'm just going to grab a handful of whatever I get. Don't do what I just did. And since they came out on this end, I'm just going to use No system to what I'm doing. Okay. So I put some beads in there too. I'm going to put the top back on. And this is your rainmaker. Okay, so now we're going to decorate the Rainmaker, uh, but I think we're going to do the kibasa and perhaps the shaker next. So we'll be right back with that. Okay, so I put the rest of my peas inside of my bottles. Didn't use any beads, but now we got a shaker. We got a bigger shaker. Okay, so all these are hand instruments. Remember, we got our kibasas. Okay, then we have our rainmaker. Okay, all these can be made at home. These are all homemade. None of this is store about. This is a nice project for the young musician. Okay, so the only thing that I needed for this was nails, rice, peas, or beans, or corn, or whatever you want to put in the inside. If you want to use rocks, I mean, just make sure that the rocks can feed through between the nails. Okay, and that's just a shipping tube. You can pick all this stuff up real cheap. Uh, the shipping tube, you probably have to go to like an uh, office supply store, Walmart, uh, Staples, Office Depot, someplace like that to get the tube. Or 
If your parents work for office and they have tubes, excellent, bring you one home. This is just regular bottles, just regular drinking bottles. Just pull the labels off of them and use them, okay? There's no wrong way to do this. These are all hand instruments, all Latin percussion instruments, okay? Same thing with the Gatorade. Just a Gatorade bottle, Arizona tea bottle, okay? That's it. That's all I use to do that. And these are instruments that I will use and I will teach with them, okay? So my next thing I'm going to do is decorate them, make them look kind of fancy, and I'll come back and show you what they look like. Again, when you decorate, you can use whatever you want to. You can use any type of craft paper you want or material and make it look however you want. Again, there's no wrong way of doing this. It's the simple way. Okay? So if you make a mistake, it's really not a mistake. Okay? So use your artistic side and make your rainmakers and your kibasa look the way you want to. Again, this is great for the young musician. Okay? So if you don't have the finances to go out and buy this stuff brand new, make it yourself. And it's not machine made. It's actually made by you, from you. Okay? So we'll be back later and I'll show you what everything looks like once I get everything decorated. Okay, so now I'm back with uh, the finished products that I use to finish my uh, Latin percussion hand instruments. Uh, the shaker, I just used some bandana that I picked up from Dollar Tree and some yarn uh, that I just picked up from Home Depot. So I went there to buy some stuff and I just went back to where the lumber is. And I just asked for some twine and got some twine. Didn't cost anything, it was free. I was already paying for something. So I got that for free. I just got enough to use uh, to decorate my hand percussions. So I did the same thing with the uh, shakers. Just got bandana and twine. I also glued it so it wouldn't come loose. And I did the same thing with the bigger shaker. Just got a different color. Same thing. Twine. Just to keep it together. Give it a different look. Just something that I like to do. Then with the uh, kibasas, I just went back to Dollar Tree. Same thing. I got dollar tape and dollar wrapping paper. You can get whatever color you want, whatever style you and the young musician like. And again, I just glued it to the bottle taped it, and there you have it. I did the same thing with both of them. Okay, so Latin percussion is normally in, in Latin and Cuba and all those Latin countries. Bright colors is what they do. They like things bright. So I use bright colors on that. But you can use whatever you want. There's no wrong way to do it. Whatever you and a young musician like to use, whatever colors they want to do. If they want to put stickers on it, let them put stickers on it. It's just to get them engaged in making hand handmade instruments, okay? All this stuff was very inexpensive to make. Stuff that you have around the house, something that you can pick up at Dollar Tree for a dollar. Everything in there is a dollar. So, and then we use this stuff with the rhythm tree to understand the time signatures of beats and also uh, working them into measures. So, thank you for tuning in. If you got any questions, you can email me and I'll be more than happy to walk you through it um, or just watch the videos over and over until you get it. It's no wrong way to do it. It's pretty simple. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Mr. Gardner, and thank you to all the other classroom teachers today. They will all be back next Wednesday with lessons again targeted for our third and fourth grade students. Tune in tomorrow, Thursday, for lessons for grades five and six. Thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day, and remember, continue learning throughout the day.